I'm grateful to the organizers of the full meeting of the Brazilian Physical Society for inviting me to deliver this plenary lecture. I'll be talking today on a few issues on global warming, the Amazon rainforest, and scientific methodology, which are directly related to physics. To start, I would like to make a disclaimer. I'm not a climatologist, I'm not a meteorologist, neither a remote sense scientist, and neither a fanatic environmentalist. I'm just an old and curious physicist who is going to talk to you today. The first question to be asked is, are global warming and deforestation a matter of concern? One striking way to ask this question is having this picture of the black uh, uh, rain day in Sao Paulo almost a year ago. This is indeed a very striking photograph at around three o'clock in the afternoon in Sao Paulo, actually close to the University of Sao Paulo. To start answering this question, let me show this plot of the temperature anomaly against year that was made by Professor James Hansen and his group at the University of Columbia last year. What is shown in the vertical axis is the temperature anomaly. In a, a few minutes, I'll be defined more precisely what anomaly means. Actually, here you can see what this plot shows. Uh, it takes the average temperature, the average global temperature of the Earth in this period from 1880 to 1900, which is taken as a reference for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then we have plotted the average global temperature of the Earth, who, uh, which I will be defined in a few minutes, also uh, shown with a uh, running window average. Uh, the blue curve means uh, 12 months average, average, and uh, the red curve, 132 months average. To 1940, approximately, uh, we, see, we see that there was not much of a change. Although, as we show uh, in the, uh, later, uh, already 1934, uh, Gee calendar uh, indicated that temperature had an increase above around 0.6 degrees centigrade with respect to this period. But what's rather relevant in this plot is what is happening after 1970. We see indeed a steady rise on the temperature, monotonic rise in the temperature in a few decades, around 40 years, which is not anything that can be explained by a natural change of the Earth's temperature. So uh, this is what we're going to be discussing today. We well, all know that uh, this rise in temperature is modernly attributed to the, to the greenhouse effect, the effect of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This question was brought up by Jean Fourier already in the middle of the 19th century. In this uh, remarkable uh, paper, he, he tried to calculate what would be the average temperature of the Earth, if we balance the incoming power from the sun with the power radiated by the Earth to the space uh, in infrared. It's, this is a very interesting paper because there are no equations on it, only discussions, and Fourier refers uh, the calculations to previous publications. Well, doing this uh, simple mod model, he uh, uh, came out with a temperature, average temperature of the Earth, around minus 13 degrees centigrade, much less than we had in his time. So immediately he uh, concluded, he made a, made a conjecture that probably what was happening at the atmosphere 
was absorbed the infrared radiation uh, uh, radiated by the Earth and then therefore keeping part of the energy close to the Earth. But that was just a conjecture. Later, the Irish physicist John Tyndall did actual measurements on the infrared absorption by atmospheric gases. We're going to discuss that in the next slide. Much later, Svante Arrhenius, the famous Swedish uh, chemist that got the Nobel Prize, he did a correct calculation using data from the John Tyndall and others and tried to predict what would happen if the CO2 atmospheric concentration would double. He concluded that there would be an average uh, increase, sorry, an increase in the average temperature of the Earth around 4.5 degrees Kelvin, very close to the, uh, the current estimates. And later, already in the 20th century, the, the uh, air, uh, uh, sorry, the railway uh, engineer, Guy Callender, made a calculation using data from 147 meteorological stations and concluded there was an uh, increase on the average temperature of the Earth around 0 degree, 0 0.3 degrees centigrade between 1880 and 1937. This is a nice uh, 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 experiment put uh, by John Tyndall. What you see here is a long tube where he inject gases. Here you see the gas reservoir. The gas is injected, passing through a scarble to clean it, and then inject in the tube. And here there is a light source where he uh, shine and shines light through the tube and then measures the light that is sorted here using Galvanon that you see on this, this small table. He, uh, for his surprise, he concluded that uh, the most abundant gases in the atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen, uh, absorb very little uh, infrared radiation. Uh, CO2, methane, uh, and other uh, three atomic uh, molecules uh, absorb much more infrared radiation. At his time, he could not explain why, because uh, uh, atomic physics were, was not yet uh, well developed. But anyway, the results were published and then used later by Svante Arrhenius. Not only the, the data of uh, John Tinder, but from other workers also. And uh, he decided then to calculate what would be the average temperature of the Earth uh, when the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere varied. He, uh, did uh, uh, not a very simple calculation. He actually defined the, the Earth in 10 degree sectors uh, uh, longitudinally from uh, 70 degrees north to minus uh, to 6 degrees south. And then for each sector, he attributed uh, mean surface temperature uh, for each of the four seasons. He included cloud. Uh, with a, a fixed cloud amount, 0 0.5, 0 0.525, with a cloud albedo of uh, 0.55, he includes the snow albedo from 0.5 to 0.7, and also water vapor. What he did not include in his model uh, was circulation. Uh, so trans heat transport through uh, atmosphere circulation. Nevertheless, uh, even making such uh, assumptions that uh, a steady state case, this paper is uh, very interesting because to reach the result, he had to make more than 100,000 calculations by hand. And came out with that uh, figure I just said, that uh, if the CO2 concentration on the atmosphere doubled, the, average, the, the increase in the average temperature of the Earth would be around 4.5 degrees Kelvin, not very far from the current estimates. Later then came this uh, uh, bridge scientist, uh, railroad engineer, who had also uh, some uh, training in physics. 
And then what he did, he took data from 107 uh, meteorology sta meteorological sta stations spread over the world that had records to the, the 19th century. And making an uh, improving upon uh, uh, a Henius model, he made that also a, a calculation and has sh he has shown that the average temperature of the Earth increased by 0 0.3 degrees, uh, degrees centigrade, as I said, uh, from 18, uh, 1880 to 1934. And he also showed that there was an increase in the CO2 uh, concentration of the atmosphere at the same time. This work of uh, Callender actually uh, opening the or gave birth to the science of the climatology as we have today. The question to be asked, and then I put this question by, to a greater Thunberg, here much then global meldo temperature. So how is actually the, glo the average global temperature of the Earth measured? And that's the question that's completely unclear for most of the lay people. And uh, is one of the reasons why this question of global warming is, uh, still raises a lot of questions, uh, doubts, I should say, in the society. Actually, we have four major data sets for the global average temperature. The GISTEM data set of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Science, the hard crop uh, data set of UK Met Ops in Adelaide, the Amy Lost uh, data set of NOAA, and the GRA data set of the J uh, Japan Meteorological Society. There are others from the University of Berkeley, Berkeley and other places in the world, but the, the, these four ones are the major ones. Well, how do they actually calculate the average temperature? That's one, one of the problems I find in most of the IPCC reports, uh, sorry, reports. They don't explain clearly enough to the, to the layman how, what they are actually meaning by, by anomalies and average temperature. So here I describe a general procedure that's not universal, but uh, uh, represented, represents most of what is being done to calculate these uh, temperature anomalies. They take combined data of measurements of the air above land and ocean surface. The measurements at each station is compared to what is considered normal for that location time. By normal here, we mean uh, uh, usually a long-term average over a 30-year period. The difference between the measurements and this normal expectation is what is called anomaly. After having the measured anomalies, an average of the anomalies is obtained for, uh, for a month. Uh, uh, and for this, they use a chosen ba uh, baseline and they separate all the measurements in a longitudinal latitudinal grid of five by, by five degrees normally, world height. In, in, any, in every place where, in which there is at least one station. In the past, and that was one of the reasons we criticized uh, about, uh, about, uh, about this uh, uh, methodology, but there are, pla where, there are places where there was no measurement and uh, people interpolate in a nearby uh, uh, stations. I, I think that's not done anymore. So the data is stable only where there is actual, actual, actually data. So the monthly uh, mean global temperature anomaly uh, is obtained by averaging the anomalies over all green box in the world uh, weighed by the area they represent. Finally, the annual seasonal mean global temperature anomalies are obtained by averaging monthly mean global temperature anomalies. And when they show the data, they use normally uh, a slide wing average that I have shown 
and the uh, fixed line cycle. So as you can see, it's not a trivial uh, procedure. It's somewhat com uh, complicated for a layman to understand what means anomaly in the uh, global Earth temperature. Nevertheless, the results are very solid. What you can see here is a result uh, given by the European Space Agency, the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So this is plot since 19, sorry, since 1850 till last year, this average temperature calculated, anomaly calculated by the different data sets, Eastend, Hardcraft, NOAA, GRA, and also include the European uh, uh, data set, uh, Copernicus Climate Change Service data set. Clear to uh, 1940, actually around here, we start seeing this increase. And here you see this monotonic increase that we have been observing since 1970. I like very much this plot because they show not only the variation, the, the anomalies in temperature, but they give actually the average temperature. You see that uh, in the 18, 18, uh, sorry, 19th century, the average temperature was around 13.5 degrees centigrade. Now it's moving to almost 14.5 degrees centigrade. So uh, this show how the, uh, the temperature nowadays is calculated, having data from uh, 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 sorry, meteorological stations. But the question is, when we want to compare what's happening now with this increase in temperature, people ask, but this is not a natural phenomenon. But to answer this question, we have to know how the temperature was in uh, centuries before our time, thousands of years before our time. How you do that? How we estimate the temperature in the, in the so long past? Well, this is what we call the historic evolution of the average temperature of the Earth. Obviously, in the past times, there were not uh, widely spread instrumental measurements of the temperature. So we, have, we must then use proxy climate indicators com, uh, combined with a uh, long instrumental uh, uh, record that we have of, uh, closer to our time. Which, uh, who are those proxies? There are many different ways to do that. One is through dendroclimatology, which uh, looks at the width of three rings. We know that a, a ring grows every year. So uh, the width of three rings because in the, when the climate is proper, the rings are thicker than in the uh, uh, colder times. We have also, uh, we can measure uh, what is uh, corals in the bottom, sedimental corals in the bottom of the sea, as I uh, say in a few, uh, in the next slide. We can measure our ice cores, as I'll describe later, and also use instrumentary, uh, instrument, historic documentary uh, records. So, so those are all proxies. They are not direct measurements of temperature. So we have to accept that the description of large scale climate variability in the past century is therefore somewhat empirical result. But this somewhat empirical uh, evaluation is rather well done. Here I give an example of a very a seminal paper by Michael Mann and, and his group and colleagues published in the Proceedings of the Na uh, National Academy of Science over to, uh, 12 years ago. They described their methodology to evaluate the temperatures, uh, the average temperature 2000 up to 2000 years ago. And uh, using all the proxies they had uh, uh, available. So, uh, so I'll describe in more detail how they do that. They do through the so called composite plus scale map. There are other procedures, but let me describe this one. You can see here diff the different proxies they use. 
tree rings, ice core, corals, documents, sediments, etc. And uh, in this color scale here, it gives the time when the, uh, since when the, the crocs were available. They did that for 1800 years. Uh, you see the red ones are the mo most modern ones and they are the most evident ones, uh, obviously. The very old ones are the blue ones and among them, uh, uh, one important one that is the isocore measurements that are, is done, are done through a met, uh, method I'll describe it next. But you see that the data is rather sparse over the world. And so they have to do a very uh, proper statistical average, uh, regress their results to our times and, uh, and correct them. In spite of that, they were able to make very good estimates of what happened uh, uh, in the past 2,000 years over the Earth. The important method uh, used in ice cores is the so-called oxygen isotope ratio method. What's that? Well, you know that the oxygen has many isotopes and the other molecule uh, is made by oxygen where you have different isotopes and also different isotopes of hydrogen, uh, either hydrogen or deuterium. Uh, uh, almost 100% uh, of the oxygen in, in nature is the normal oxygen, oxygen 16. But there is a small, very small percentage of oxygen 18 that also participates in the water molecule. The water molecule is oxygen 18 is a little heavier than the normal one. And that means that it's more difficult to evaporate. So uh, the, you know that most of the ice deposit on the poles is due to evaporation over the sea, uh, where uh, the, va the vapor is carried along by the, circular, uh, the circulation, the top atmosphere, and then precipitates over uh, the poles. During this trajectory, uh, we have also raining, falling uh, uh, all the time, as shows this cartoon from NASA. Well, what happens is the, the, the water with the heavier oxygen has a tendency, a tendency to precipitate before the normal, uh, the water is normal oxygen. So the ice deposit on the poles is richer in oxygen 16 than here over the ocean. However, this ratio varies with temperatures. When you have years, very hot years, there is more, much more uh, evaporation and much more water with oxygen 618 come to the poles. In the cold uh, periods, there is less oxygen 18 here come to the poles, as you see in the next slide. Also, uh, the water, uh, the precipitate water over the ocean and also coming from uh, the uh, melting of the, uh, the glacial me melting over the poles brings the water to the, to the oceans and that uh, is trapped in seashells, uh, depository on the bottom of the sea that can also be analyzed. Here you see one of those uh, 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 samples taken on the uh, Greenland ice project that I think uh, uh, ran for around 30 years or a little, little bit more. Well, the first thing to do is how to uh, gauge the depth of this uh, cylinder with time. The way to do this, there are different techniques. One obviously is is through carbon for carbon 14th that we can uh, 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 calculate here uh, uh, depth against time. The other possibility is to measure the variation of oxygen uh, 618th to oxygen 18, uh, 16 in the samples and uh, see how was the seasonal variation of this concentration. So the uh, fall in the season, then we can also measure time along this cylind cylinder rod of ice. Here you see how this is done. This is a measurement 
in the Greek, in the 93 project from 1990 to 1994. And uh, the uh, <coughs> red curve is the ratio of oxygen uh, 18 to oxygen 15, the measure to this delta, eight, uh, delta oxygen 18, which uh, I'll explain in the next slide. But anyway, you see very clear the seasonal variation of this ratio. And at the same time, with the blue curve, is the temperature measure in the same place at the same stage. You see there is a very nice agreement between the two curves. And that also gives us a rule, a gauge to move back in time and see how was the temperature in past time following this ice rock. On the top of that, by analyzing through a mass spectrometer, uh, the air trapped in, in, in bubbles in this ice, you can also measure the concentration of CO2 and other greenhouse gases uh, there at the same time. So this uh, uh, technique gives a very nice proxy to, uh, 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 <coughs> similar to evaluate how was the temperature in past times. This, uh, as I said, is uh, delta oxygen 18 is calculated through this formula, which here is the ratio uh, between oxygen 18, oxygen uh, uh, 16 uh, measure in uh, parts per million, minus what is the normal one in the Vienna standard mean ocean uh, water. This is just a standard for uh, <coughs> isotopic concentration in pure water divided by the same value. So this is what delta oxygen 18 mean. So here you see a plot of 100,000 100, years. Today, uh, zero is today moving back in the past. So you see that we only move from zero to uh, around 11.5 uh, uh, 11, uh, uh, 11 uh, thousand years before, which correspond to Hiroshima period. Uh, this concentration is almost, uh, is very quiet actually, showing that this was a quiet period regarding temperature variation. Then moving back in time, we go to the Pleistocene period, where you see there are many variations on the uh, concentration, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. And around here was actually the, uh, the la latest ice age. So we see that it's, this technique indeed gives a very good uh, proxy for evaluating how was the temperature in the long past. Well, uh, having seen then how we look to the past, let's ask now how we look to the future. Well, that means how reliable are the predictions of global warming? Uh, to answer this question based on a very good analysis of this paper by Anderson, Hawkins, and Jones. We know that the IPCC projects, uh, projection of how will be the temperature by the end of this century is based on very complicated and elaborate state-of-the-art Earth system models that essentially uh, solves uh, the uh, Navier-Stokes equation, also using, taking that out the radiation received from the sun and all the circulation and all the effects, ocean effects uh, uh, in the earth. You see here uh, predictions of IPCC to the end of this century uh, in two scenarios. This RCP scenario 8.5 is a scenario in which almost nothing is done. All, all the lines represent different uh, models and you see there is indeed a large variation in the predictions. The RCP 2.6 scenario is where a good control of uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is carried out. In this case, we see also a, a large spread 
of the temperature by increased by the end of the century. The nice observation of those, uh, these authors is that in spite of these uh, complex systems, uh, models, all we have is based upon very uh, standard physics, which is just radiative transfer of uh, energy received from the sun and radiate to the, back to the space by, by the Earth. So this is very simple, uh, actually, model. So they took then the calculations done by uh, Guy Callender, and Callender actually uh, improved a lot over Arrhenius model. First, he divided the atmosphere uh, into layers, so he could also take into account the variation of temperature and CO2 concentration with height. He still didn't include circulation, but it probably uh, includes the feedback by water vapor. So what that they did, uh, these authors, is that to show that uh, the variation temperature predicted by Callender's model can be fit by this expression. Delta T is 2.28 log of the CO2 concentration in parts per million minus 250. Using this simple uh, uh, is, is scaling, they took the data of CO2 variations since 1800 to uh, 2000, not only of CO2, but also CO2 equivalent of other greenhouse gases. And with this, they try to reproduce what this uh, the temperature variation predict over the past years. Then you see this comes with this red curve here. And you see, you can see very clear, this red uh, curve follows rather well what has been measured over the, uh, the past years. So looking into this result, they use the same expression to predict what will be the temperature variation by the end of hours of this century. And then in the two scenarios I just discussed, and you see those two lines here. It's very clear that the two lines predicted by the calendar's model, they give a lower bound for the predictions uh, come from the very complex Earth system models. So what we can say, uh, let's say safely, is that uh, in, spite, in spite of the variation of different models, this lower bound is based upon very straightforward and solid physics. So if nothing's done, indeed, we expect by the end of the century, a temperature variation around uh, three degrees uh, centigrade. So accepting that the temperature increase is due to uh, a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we have to ask the question, how to decrease this uh, uh, CO2 concentration? Well, the best way to do this is through carbon uh, sequestration. That means absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. And one of the most effective, actually the most effective tool we have is to the growth of forests, in particular tropical forests. So let's move to this subject next. Here I show a plot of a paper by the Rainford Collaboration, which includes scientists from Great Britain and also from Brazil from EP. What you see here in this map on the right is the Amazon forest, not only in Brazil, but in all 10 Amazon countries around Brazil. The uh, red rectangles you see here, they indicate the CO2 emission due to deforestation and burning of the forests. The black rectangles, they give the CO2 emission due to use the use of fossil fuels. And the red return, which are negative, they go down, they give the CO2 absorption by the forest uh, as the forest grow. And we can see here that if we add the areas of all the green rectangles, we, 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 we see that we still absorb more uh, CO2 than we actually emit the atmosphere. However, as this left plot shows, 
Unfortunately, this positive effect is decreasing with time due to deforestation, not only in Brazil, but also in other countries. So this was the uh, positive balance in terragrams of carbon per year in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have for the last decade. But we see very clear this tendency of decreasing this uh, positive absorption of carbon, what is indeed rather worrisome. I believe that Moro, in his presentation, Professor Paula Tarsho will more properly uh, discuss this uh, subject. Unfortunately, deforestation in Brazil, in the Amazon, is going uh, uh, steadily for the last uh, 40 years. When Brazil was discovered, the Amazon had uh, an area around 5 million square kilometers, uh, Amazon forest. We see that uh, since uh, 1980, we start deforestating quite uh, uh, rapidly. Here you see this arm of deforestation. It's called the arc of deforestation uh, by Dr. Professor Beta Becker that unfortunately uh, left us already. But you see that uh, deforestation is concentrated this arc that runs from Maranhão to the north of Mato Grosso. But there are also other areas of deforestation that follow rivers and some roads concentrate in different areas of the Amazon. For those that want to see that, uh, there is a, this very nice paper by Inácio Amigo this year that describes rather well how the deforestation is proceeding what, in what we call the uh, <coughs> fish, uh, uh, fish uh, 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 scheme that we can see here, fish bone scheme that we see falling roads or rivers. So uh, what we have today in 2020 is that in, uh, the total forest clear, clear goes over 20%. How this deforestation is monitored by INPE, the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research, through two, two systems that I'll describe in the, in the second, PRODS and the TER. The PRODS uh, system gives either, uh, early, yearly rates of clear cuts of the Amazon forest that you can see here down, I'll discuss more better later but how are the forests almost completely clear. And the DDR system that is more recent, they gives also not only, uh, gives alerts of not only deforestation, but, uh, but also of the degradation of the forest that will be fine soon. This product uh, system that we all in Brazil are very proud of, actually started in 1988. First, using smart uh, images of the Landsat series of satellites. More recently, we use the, also data from the Brazilian satellites, Seabirds 4 or A, and the Indian sa satellite R IRS2, uh, with 20 to 30 meter resolution. Here you see the result of uh, the product system. Starting this diagram, start from uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 1988 to, to, to 2000, uh, uh, 2019, last year, then, all the year re yearly rates of deforestation. Here is uh, when you start around uh, uh, 21,000 square kilometers deforestated. We had two peaks in this time series. The, the largest ones was uh, in 2000, sorry, 1995, over 20, uh, 29,000 uh, square kilometers deforestated. And the second peak was 2004, over 27,000 square kilometers. When this happened, the government asked INPE to develop this alert system that they call DETER, which gives not only the yearly deforestate area, but gives daily alerts of uh, deforestations. 
So using data from the pair and with strong measures against illegal uh, deforestation and illegal mining in the Amazon, the government was able to drop down the, uh, the deforestated area by almost over 8%, from 27,000 to a little over 4,000 and 2012. This result, already in 2004, the, the result was rated by the Science Magazine, calling the Brazil Monitor System the envy of the world. Later in 2012, in an art in nature, they call this decrease the big, biggest environment success story in a decade, decade uh, regarding monitoring uh, the tropical forest, deforestation in tropical forests. Unfortunately, since 2012, the rate of deforestation started increasing. So last year, we had over 19, sorry, over 10,000 square kilometers. And this year, we are expecting something between 13 and 15,000 square, uh, square kilometers. So moving to the figures of uh, uh, over 10 years ago, unfortunately. The DTR system that gives alerts not only of deforestation, but also of selective logging and degradation of the forest, as I said, start 2004, and use mostly the Wi-Fi camera that I will describe soon uh, of the satellites Silver Shore and 4A. Uh, INPI, the National Institute for Space Research, not only use data from different satellites, world satellites, but develop uh, our own satellites. Here you see the, the, the latest two satellites developed by INPI. The Cirrus 4A satellites, that, that which is developed in, in a collaboration with China, where Brazil builds half of the satellite, the Chinese half of the satellite was launched last year, in December of last year, and uh, sorry, let me move back, uh, moving uh, in December of last year, and it's now in orbit together with satellite Cibros 4. This Chinese-Brazilian collaboration to develop uh, uh, remote science satellites, Earth observation satellites, was really a success, a 30-year success uh, at, at that is uh, was recognized by UNOSA, which is the Office of the United Nations for Pacific Union of Space, as a paradigmatic example of success in a South-South collaboration in space science. Unfortunately, this program has been discontinued by the current government. Here is the other satellite developed by INPI, Amazon One, that is entirely developed in Brazil, built in Brazil, and is to be launched uh, next year in March. And then we are going to have a third satellite monitoring the Amazon forest. I'll give a few data about the Cebus uh, 4A satellite, which is here, you have an artist, uh, artist drawing of the satellite. For instance, since I'm showing here the solar panel, uh, of the satellites completely developed and built in Brazil, for instance. So we have parameters of the two uh, uh, satellites. They are polar orbit satellites uh, with an uh, orbit inclination. That means the angle with the equator a little bit over 90 degrees. And they are heliosynchronous satellites. That means they cross the equator always at the same time. The local time in Brazil for the two satellites is uh, at 10 30 in the morning. And they have uh, equivalent uh, uh, revision days. Also, the Cibers, a large, uh, higher orbit, comes sooner to the same place than Cibers 4A. An important thing that uh, data to be given in a physics uh, uh, event is a description of the chamber, uh, sorry, of the cameras used by this, those satellites. The first one uh, that I'd like to discuss is the MOOCs camera, which is a MOOCs spectral camera entirely developed 
and built in Brazil. It has these four bands for observation with a resolution of 60 meters. A swatch of width, so the air, the area that is, is being swept uh, on the ground as a silent, uh, the satellite moves in his orbit around 120 kilometers and a revisiting time of 31 days. This Wi-Fi camera, this wide field camera, was also entirely developed in Brazil. And that's the camera that's actually used in the air system. It has a much smaller resolution than the MOOC camera, but on the other hand, has a larger SWAT uh, width. So that means that it uh, can uh, sweep over the ground a, large, a much larger area and has a, a much smaller Revis, uh, shorter revisiting time over the same place of the of five days. So that's the camera that's very important for the alerts of the detail system. In CBRS 4A, there we have a new camera which is quite relevant. It's a WPM camera that were that was developed by our Chinese colleagues. This is a very nice camera because it has a multi panoramic uh, wide scan camera and also other three bands. This panchromatic uh, camera has a two meter resolution, very good re resolution of the order of the, uh, the resolution of the nanosatellite used by Planet, the Planet company. Actually, a bit, even a bit smaller. So with this camera, we have uh, the, our Brazilian satellites now have a very good resolution that can look at details when this is needed. An example of that you can see here. This was a disaster this year, August 12th, uh, in Maurice Lines Island, uh, or a oil spill. Every time there is an accident in the world like that, there is a, a world organization called Chapter that asks for all countries that have satellites of different images to provide the images freely to uh, evaluate the disaster. So one of the ones that were asked for data from the CBRS 4A WPM camera. You can see here this, the inset, the details, look in the uh, spill, uh, oil spill with a two by two meter resolution, which indeed quite nice. Another point uh, from the uh, important physics point I'd like to discuss is the question of atmospheric correction. A very important uh, physical data about uh, uh, the Earth is to calculate the, the reflectance of the soil, or that means the surface albedo. And to do that uh, from the satellite, we have to properly take into account the uh, absorption and scattering of sunlight by the atmosphere. In the case of the MOOC cameras of uh, uh, the CBRS 4 and 4A satellites, that cannot be done directly from the images because the camera does not, has, does not have a band proper to, to uh, evaluate the aer aerosol uh, reflections. So that has been a problem. But fortunately, the scientists from it developed a very nice technique for taking account the atmosphere absorption is kept, even not have, having a proper sensor. They developed what is called the coupled moderate products for atmospheric corrections. What they did, they took, to, uh, they took data from MODIS, which a moderate resolution, has a moderate resolution image the spectrometer and also visible infrared images by the on suite from satellites, particularly uh, uh, Landsat satellite, that can in some case observe the same spot that uh, the MOOCs camera uh, is observing at the same time. So they uh, compare data from the MOOCs camera with this Landsat 8 only uh, cameras. So I can see in the, and then they developed, developed a very nice technique how to uh, correct the results of MOOCs uh, with this data from the other satellites. 
So you can see here the result, a very uh, interesting result. So this uh, uh, over in a spot of a Parai state, you can see here. And the, the, this is the data, correct data of the Seabrook's MOOC uh, tumor. And here's uh, the data from Landsign 8 satellite. What's plot here is the reflectance uh, of, the, of the Earth for uh, uh, different bands. So we have here blue, green, red, and uh, 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 near infrared. And you have uh, uh, compares between blue are the data of MOOCs of Brazil Cibers 4 and only is the data of uh, Landsat. So we can see a very good agreement of the correction is properly done and that gave a, an enlarged actually the application of the books uh, cameras of the Brazilian satellites to measure surface uh, reflectance. Another important uh, technique developed by Brazilians and also the world got in, in our case by uh, Brazilian scientists is to monitor uh, the Amazon forest at the height of trees, the height and uh, diameter of large trees using light LIDAR. The LIDAR technique, to uh, the use of LIDAR technique to monitor forces uh, was developed around 20 years ago. It's very nice, it's essentially based upon the possibility of a LIDAR to give uh, a large number of measurements, a large several return per centimeter square over some distance. So uh, the LIDAR has been used actually in the past to map the forest all over the world with one, uh, one kilometer by a one kilometer resolution. What I will show now are the results of a work that has been recently done by Brazilian scientists, which is very, very important. This is done uh, through a collaboration between INPI and other others, uh, other uh, collaborators like University of Exeter in the United Kingdom and other organizations in Brazil. What you see here, what they do, they use data from, uh, from NASA, from the Landsat uh, satellite, and they uh, also do LIDAR measurements using uh, airborne LIDAR measurement on some select areas. And in doing that, they can uh, take the data from the satellite, from Landsat, for instance, and then uh, using the radar from airborne radar, they can over a large area monitor the height of the trees, as you can see here. And that is very, very important to calculate CO2 emission and absorption by the forest. This work was the front cover of uh, science uh, last month. This work done by scientists from EPI uh, was actually a result of the thesis of silver, the first water you can see here. This was considered a very relevant result because they showed that uh, uh, the edges of the forest which have been already the uh, deforestated, they have an impact, a very serious impact on carbon emission that was not taken into account previously. How they do this? They do, as I said, they took, they take image, images from the Landsat satellite series to 30 meter resolution and some select areas, some select stretch of the forest, they do a, uh, uh, they collect light, light data with airplanes. You can see here, uh, I sketch what uh, they do. Here you have the intact old growth forest, and here you have a college scale where uh, uh, the dark side, red side, uh, correspond to trees 40 meters high. Here you have the forest edge, and here you have the completely forested area, a clear cut area. Right? as we say. So in the past, when the uh, CO2 emission was calculated, they took into account the completely growth 
force with uh, uh, normally gross force to complete the clear cut for the state area. What this uh, work has been done is to take into account now in a proper way the uh, uh, collaborate, sorry, the contribution of the forest edge. See, so we can see the results. A is the spatial variability of carbon losses calculated only between 2001 and 2015. And that is a very important period because as I said before, from 2004, 2012, there was a, a very strong de decrease in the deforestation, the Amazon, which uh, makes easier to compare what had, happens with complete deforestation area with the edges of the forest. So here they take the, uh, the, the results from the edge of the forest, here from the completely deforestate areas. And here you see an histogram, two histograms that can compare the two. What you see here is uh, the number of pixels with uh, deforestate area per pixel. For instance, you cannot properly see here, but this is point, uh, uh, 0.01 to 0.017 uh, teragrams uh, deforestate per pixel. So they uh, did that and compare what came from the edge uh, of the deforestate area compared to the total deforestate area. And here you have the two contributions combined. Uh, the important result they reached is that uh, they found that one third of loss from deforestation com uh, comes actually from the edge effect that was not properly taken into account in the past. And we expect that would be taken into account and uh, to uh, calculate the CO2 uh, emission by Brazil to uh, uh, follow the rules of the Paris Agreement 2015. How we are actually uh, following uh, our uh, commitment to this agreement. We know that Brazil has committed to decrease all the emission of uh, uh, greenhouse gas by 2030. Finally, I'll talk about uh, the so-called synthetic aperture radar satellites. We have seen in the press in the last months that the Brazilian government is trying to, is proposing to buy uh, uh, SAR satellite to monitor deforestation in the Amazon. And they say one of the reasons is to help the monitoring done by INPE because the radar can look through uh, the clouds and so monitor deforestation even when the octosatellites cannot see it. And uh, I'll show to you today that actually the uh, justification of the government is not correct because in before more than around 30 years has been done, doing very good work using satellites in, uh, from, uh, so using uh, synthetic aperture uh, satellite data to for different works although Brazil does not have its own satellite. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain uh, how the synthetic aperture radar works. Uh, here we have in this table the frequencies used by radar uh, coming from the Kappa U uh, uh, band to the L band. As we move up here, we move down in frequency and therefore we move up in, uh, in wavelength. The Brazilian bond is uh, uh, suggesting to buy a satellite operating the X band. The X band has a wavelength between 3.75 to 2.5 centimeters. So somewhat a relatively small wavelength. That means that if you shine the forest with uh, uh, this radar at this frequency, most of the uh, electromagnetic wave is going to be reflected by the canopy of the forest. However, if you want to look more carefully in the forest, can we want to look uh, uh, 
uh, reflection from the ground and from the top of the trees, it's much better to use the L band, which has wavelength between 30 and 50 centimeters by simple physical reasons, as we know. One important uh, uh, point about the radar is that we have to remember the radar illumination is coherent. That means we can use the data not on amplitude and the time of return of the signals, but also phase to, uh, to, uh, to uh, calculate uh, the reflections. And also this uh, fact that is coherent allow us to uh, use the SAR technique. What is the SAR technique? To improve, uh, to improve resolution when you have an antenna that shines uh, the, the electromagnetic waves to the target, to improve the resolution would be very nice if the satellite had, had a very large antenna. But obvious for satellite, this is not feasible. So what the synthetic aperture radar uh, concept does is to consider a uh, 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 length that uh, depends on frequency and depends on satellite, such that as the satellite moves along its orbit, it takes the reflected uh, signals from, uh, from the target as if they were all, all emitted at the same time. So knowing the uh, time of flight of the satellite and assume that the satellite uh, orbit is very stable and very well controlled, what is difficult to do for a small satellites, but assume that this is true, then we can consider the reflect uh, signals as, as if uh, we had a very large antenna lying down uh, along the trajectory. So with this technique, we can emulate a large antenna with a small antenna. This technique was developed around 30 years ago, is indeed very, very successful. So I'll show the, uh, the last uh, issue to discuss today, an application of that by ink scientists. We all remember from last year, the unfortunate disaster in the Brumandinho mines in Minas Gerais. What this, this scientists from ink did was to use data from the Sentinel-1B satellites, which uh, uh, they, they have a differential uh, uh, interferometric uh, uh, system, DIN SAR, and have free image available to users. So using this data and uh, took the data from uh, this satellite in the interferometric uh, wide SWAT mode, uh, they use two different image processing techniques. One is the small baseline subset and the other is the persistent scatter interferometry. SBAS and PSI. I will not describe them in detail due to time, but the ones interested can see how this uh, processing technique vary from one to the other in those two publications here. The important point for us is to know that the SBAS uh, uh, technique gives better space coverage. However, the, the PSI technique gives more accurate result over some sparse Grid points. And you can see here the result. Uh, here you have in Brumadinho uh, uh, mine, uh, at the depository there, the tailings of the mine. You have the data from process with SDAS, so a large number of data, but not many points with a very long earth movement, as you can see here. And then you have some scattered data, use the PSI technique where they could see more large displacements around seven centimeters uh, on the top here. And here is the final result. We see a long time since March uh, uh, 16th, 2018 to January 22, that means three days before the dam collapse, how the displacement in the line of sight of the satellite uh, changed. Uh, calculate to, uh, with the two techniques. You see the SBAS technique does not give uh, very good accuracy, 
but that can give us a, a broader coverage of the area, and the PCSCI gives a more uh, uh, accurate result. And you see here, you see the histogram of uh, 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 pluviometry uh, on, on the dam, Brumadinho Dam. You can see very clear that with satellites, they were able to detect between four and five uh, movements over the, the, the ground. Days, five, four, four, actually here, uh, uh, almost 15 days before the accident occurred. So if the government, if we had this system developed for uh, all our dumps, we could indeed be uh, see, forecast to any problem in the future and save many lives. And that shows that indeed, regarding use of SAR satellites, the expertise in Brazil is in NIPI and not in other places. I will finish this talk making just a, an overall comment that I consider very important. That Brazilian political leaders, they must learn that science and social justice are the mandatory basis for the sustainable development of our society. Thank you for your attention.